Good afternoon. This is a, a really big room. I can barely see the back. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about the Russian Olive Biocontrol Program today, and I do have a slightly negative uh, just how far back is a back burner. And I want to say right up front that um, the program is moving along quite well. That really refers to some of the some of the regulatory hurdles and potential regulatory hurdles that will that we will encounter. I'd like to frame the frame the project. We could either just see if I break this, then they'll never be with me. Okay, um, I'd like to divide my, I'd like to, uh, to structure my talk around the three phases of biological control. And before I get started, I want to say that I'm not working on this project. We're waiting for the results of the project, which would be biocontrol agents, to come down the line. So if I ever say we or I, it's really uh, a set of, of USDA people in the U.S. and overseas explorers who, who are doing this project. Um, Biocontrol is a three-phase process. One, the preliminary phase, which is identification of, of the target and the biology of the target and possible at least initial uh, enemies of the target. And as you know, biocontrol is conducted against invasive species that come from elsewhere, come from uh, other continents. And so in order to do biocontrol, you have to locate the natural enemies of of, of of the target, in this case, Russian olive. Uh, feasibility and necessity is the, is the project. Can the project be done, essentially? And is it necessary to do it? Uh, the foreign exploration phase involves finding natural enemies in the native range of the, the plant and <clears throat> determining if these natural enemies are host specific enough to be safe and if they do a good enough job to be effective or, or efficacy. And the final phase is done partly uh, in quarantine in um, in the U.S. and most of it really involves regulatory hurdles, which we'll get into. Um, the first question is: It feasible? And I've divided it up into uh, three different sections. First, uh, is it feasible from a biological perspective? And we have uh, good evidence now that tree biocontrol is quite feasible. A couple of the a couple of the big success stories have come in North America. One of them is Tamarix. You're all familiar with that, and and Diarabda, the Tamarix beetle. Um, another success story has occurred in Florida, where the tree Melaleuca, which came from Australia, became a serious major problem in Florida, um, and a biocontrol program was developed. A suite of agents were developed, and now Melaleuca is under control. A suite of agents included a included a weevil. So biocontrol is feasible. Uh, with with Russian olive, um, if we just if we pursue it, if we decide we're going to pursue it. Um, <clears throat> is it feasible from a safety standpoint? A lot of times um, when we pick a biocontrol target, um, especially if it's in a if it's in a plant group that have uh, that have a lot of close relatives in North America, it becomes very difficult to find host specific agents. And this would be the case, let's say, for the mustards. Or, um, or for the thistles, which we've had a lot of problems finding really host specific agents for. There are just too many congeners in North America or other closely related species. In the case of, uh, in the case of Russian olive, there really aren't that many closely related species. Russian olives in the Eliagniaceae, and there are only uh, about four species of, of those in North America. Although a couple of them are really, uh, really choice wonderful species. We have, uh, we have silver buffalo berry growing in our backyard. Um, it's a great replacement species for Russian olive. Um, oh, I also have on the slide to remind you that uh, that olive is not related to Russian olive. Uh, the olive that we get olive oil from is a completely different family. We don't have to worry about any crossing over in bio of biocontrol agents. Um, is it feasible from a regulatory perspective? And here I'm a little uh, little less optimistic. One reason, but not the only reason, is that there are threatened and endangered species that utilize Russian olive. And here I have the yellow-billed cuckoo as a primary example. 
uh, but there are others, including several mammalian species that could potentially feed on Russian olive seeds. And when it comes time to evaluate the project and the program, uh, these will definitely come up and will have to be addressed one by one uh, as to whether a biocontrol project would uh, would jeopardize their existence. There are other regulatory issues um, in terms of Russian olive being a, an ornamental, Russian olive being a valued tree, and we'll get into those. Um, is it necessary and desirable? And that's also something that has to be addressed in the preliminary phase. Um, is it necessary means do we really need do we really need biocontrol in our arsenal of control methods for Russian olive? Uh, is it desirable? Do we really want to control it at all? And I think this question is framed almost entirely by the notion that Russian olive is a conflict species. Uh, Russian olive has some uses, some potential ecosystem services, but it has some downsides too, and that's why I'm going to go through these four, uh, four potential points of conflict uh, with Russian olive. And then, uh, you know, the choice of whether to deploy biocontrol or not really ends up uh, uh, up to up to the regulators and the, and the end users. First, uh, wildlife habitat. It's very, um, this is a, a very murky area. Russian olive seeds are, Russian olive fruits are consumed by a number of different bird species. Um, and, but whether they're highly nutritious or not is a matter of controversy. There's also the fact that they are consumed by uh, European starlings, among others, which are themselves uh, undesirable and, and invasive species. And European starlings are also critical in the spread of Russian olive seeds. These studies have come out recently showing that they distribute the seeds, particularly away from the riparian corridors. Um, trees are used for birds um, as, as nesting substrate, but they're also used as cover. And really, almost any any shrub or tree in a riparian corridor is used used by birds for cover. So it's not unusual that Russian olives would fall into this category. Um, one of the problems with uh, with looking at looking at birds in general is you might get a different picture once you start looking at different guilds. And it's true in Russian olives that um, that cavity nesters are almost completely absent in areas dominated by a Russian olive, and this has been shown in a couple of studies. So it's not just the quantity of birds, but it is, uh, it's the diversity and the types of birds that you have uh, that will determine how you feel about wildlife habitat. Um, the yellow-billed cuckoo does, has been known to nest in Russian olive, which could potentially be a big hurdle to overcome, except I would say that in areas where Russian olive is not dominant, and they're using uh, using native species. They do much better, but still we see uh, sort of echoes of the southwestern little flycatcher problem in uh, in Russian olive and yellow-billed cuckoo. Its use as windbreaks or shelter belts um, can be uh, best best explained by Mr. Wick, who says, "I don't think there's any such thing as a bad tree down here," um, and he. That's out on the plains, out in South Dakota, where very little grows. Um, Russian olive is prized because it can grow most anywhere and it grows quickly and can form these uh, dense thickets. I think it's probably um, part of the program and probably up to us in Russian olive control to come up with some alternatives to, uh, to Russian olive shelter belts and windbreaks. Maybe possibly native species or more desirable species. Invasion potential. I think we have to look at that when we're evaluating Russian olive. Uh, Russian olive doesn't invade as quickly as tamarix, but according to many that I've taught, many people I've talked to, it's a it's potentially more of a problem with a slower trajectory. But uh, could but since Russian olive can survive outside of the riparian corridor, it could potentially become a far worse problem than than tamarix in the in the long run. We have to pay close attention to that when we're thinking about control, not just what's there today, but what's going to be there 20 or 30 years down the road. Russian olive as um, a, a driver of ecosystem change. I think we have to pay attention to that, too. 
there's a, a lot of new work coming out on that realm. And um, Colden Baxter from Idaho State University has done some some really nice work um, that that has just that has just hit the presses the last few years on Russian olive invasion in a previously uninvaded um, uh, area of Deep Creek, Idaho, where they had some actual baseline data on on the health and nutrient cycling in the stream. And because Russian olive is a, a good solid nitrogen fixer, it changes the uh, the dynamics of nutrient cycling in the stream. Russian olive drops a lot of leaves in the stream, and so uh, you really change the nature of the riparian ecosystem after Russian olive has has moved in. One of the one of the things that Baxter's group has worked on is the relationship between carp, which is also an invasive species, and Russian olive. Carp can utilize Russian olive as a food source, and so the carp, uh, the, the carp biomass in Deep Creek has increased eightfold uh, since the invasion of Russian olive. They call it an invasional meltdown, and you can see some of these uh, some of these trophy carp that might become far more uh, far more common if we have if we have Russian olive in the system. There are there are conflicts in the in the Russian olive control and biocontrol program. These are being met um, by the USDA, uh, John Gaston's group up in up in Montana, including Kevin Delaney and and Aaron Esplin. And some of our overseas explorers have asked these questions, like, what are the real environmental impacts of Russian olive? And we need to know the answers before we move forward. Uh, what are the goals of Russian olive management, and is biocontrol a good option for this? So the resolution of conflicts is an ongoing and very wide open, uh, a very wide open process, open to uh, anyone who manages lands and anyone who has a uh, an affection for a fear of Russian olive can really Im have an input in this process. We want everybody to speak their mind, um, and we'll utilize all that information. By we, I mean they will, um, in in the potential development of Russian olive projects. So it's really wide open, and I just want to say that um, biocontrol is not a top secret government conspiracy in this case, but rather it's a it's a wide open book. People can go in and they can see what's going on. They can look at the data. They can analyze the programs and the progress. And when the agents are, if they ever are released. Uh, people will be informed of that and know about it. Our overseas phase includes um, work from a series of, of overseas cooperators that stretch really across Eurasia. Um, Ur Schaffner, Massimo Christopher, and Roman Ishenko have been uh, have been real um, instrumental in getting this off the ground in in Eurasia. And of course, you have to. Discover the biocontrol agents, and you have to do our initial levels of host range testing on them. Um, Roman and and Massimo Cristofaro have done overseas exploring, that is, searching for natural enemies across the swath of, of stretching from West Asia to Central Asia, and have sampled. Five minutes left. Have sampled. Um, uh, biocontrol or potential biocontrols across the swath, and have have discovered that not only are there biocontrol agents, potential biocontrol agents, but that every time they sample a site, they seem to pick up new ones. And it's like sampling a bag of candy. If you pick up a new one every time you put your hand in, it means there's a really good, uh, a good widespread and diverse group. So we can probably find good agents. We have found some, but we can probably find more if need. If needed, and the 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 center of Russian olive is in the Pamir Range, which looks something like this. It's very difficult to reach, but our overseas explorers are trying to go there. It's called the the top of the world. They're trying to go there and and sample in areas that um, that are essentially the, the origins of Russian olive, where they can probably find even more potential agents. So far, they've found various agents which cause different levels of damage on Russian olive. Uh, beetles, psyllids, which are sap-sucking insects, mites, and moths. But because of our concern over existing Russian olive plants and damage to existing Russian olive plants, 
Um, the ones that could potentially kill a Russian olive have been crossed off the list, at least temporarily, and we're focusing on mites. They're focusing on mites and moths. Um, a gall forming mite uh, has come a long way in the, in the process of, of host range evaluation and testing. It's a Seria angustifolia. It causes, uh, it causes the growing shoot tips of Russian olive to shrivel up and potentially would stop formation of fruits. Um, we have good, they have good collaborators in, in Iran, uh, who can measure the influence of mites from year to year on specific Russian olive trees and can also look at host range of the mite. Um, the mite appears to be highly host specific. It won't even hit a close relative, silver buffalo berry at all. Uh, some mites lived on silver berry for a short time, small numbers of them. But when, when they were brought out into the open field to host range test, uh, they, they did not live on silverberry either. So even the closest relatives in North America, Russian olive, have almost no, the mites have no impact on them. So they're highly host specific. Um, to further characterize the mites, they've been genetically barcoded. That is, uh, the genetic sequence of, of, uh, of CO1 has been determined for the mites and you can, use that barcode to determine the species of mite you're dealing with. This is important because mite taxonomy is a little difficult. They're small and hard to work with on a morphological level. But we have molecular markers and they actually indicate the potential that what we think is what they thought was one species might actually be two or even three. Um, as a second place to look, aside from looking at Russian olive trees, look at Russian olive fruit. And this is a this is a bin of Russian olives that is on sale on sale in uh, in a marketplace in Turkey. Um, also on sale in the same marketplace, uh, some Pringles. But I, <laughs> Russian olives probably uh, more nutritious for you. And out of Russian olive fruit was discovered a, a moth that has potential for control, um, and they're they're working on that but it's really difficult to work with. It's difficult to keep it in culture. It's difficult to do host range testing. Okay, here um, I want to conclude the overseas exploration by saying that we have a lot of good overseas co cooperators and collaborators, and they are producing a good product that is an, an end product of not only an agent that could possibly be used, and I, I would say the mites are number one, possibly the moth, but... Um, used specifically to attack fruits and and flowers so that the trees remain intact. The third part is what happens over here, which is further host range testing. And then we approach the technical advisory group, which is a, a group of scientists uh, from government agencies involved in land management and <clears throat> it includes reps from Canada and Mexico. And if they say that the data show that the, the Russian olive control agents are safe and potentially effective, they pass that back to the USDA APHIS. USDA APHIS can then consult with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, a Section 7 consultation, which essentially means, um, will this affect any threatened and endangered species? When they get back the answer on that, uh, they can issue a 526 permit, maybe, maybe not, depending on, on how they happen to feel about other aspects of the program and project. Um, a 520, uh, a Section 7 consultation would obviously involve looking at threatened and, and endangered species such as the yellow-billed cuckoo and possibly even the southwestern fly willow flycatcher. And at this point, we have to uh, stop and consider how we feel about uh, biocontrol and endangered species. Um, do we look at the long run where biocontrol might actually help uh, in the recovery of functional ecosystems or do we look in the short run? And that, that's, certainly a, that's certainly a question that is always out there when it comes to t and &E species and will definitely be there when it comes to Russian olive. And finally, they can, uh, they can issue it or deny it a 526 permit, and in order to do that, and in order to get to this point, 
we need a solid scientific background or basis. We require knowledge. We require not only knowledge of the invasive species and its potential for harming the ecosystem, but also knowledge of how a biocontrol agent could potentially influence the invasive species and what influence that might have on the environment. And for that, we have to look. We have to look to science, and we have to look uh, not only to the science of biocontrol, but the science of invasion, uh, the science of restoration, and 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 what we really require is a, a good, solid knowledge base. And of course, I, I say less drama, more science. Um, this is a this is a, a headline from the Salt Lake City Weekly a few years ago about tamarisk, and it was certainly dramatic, even though it's completely um, untrue. Uh, and what we need is a, a cooler-headed look at at the at the long-range prospects for ecosystem recovery. And I threw in a couple slides from Aaron Esplund, who who works up in uh, in the Sydney facility, and she's currently looking at Russian olive removal and long-term recovery um, on the Yellowstone River, and her her project is scheduled to go out for about 10 years. And that's what we really need: long-range, a long-range look at Russian olive impact on the ecosystem, a long-range look on what removing Russian olive does to the uh, to the ecosystem. And when she gave me that slide, she said I had to show this one too. Uh, she's giving her uh, her results at the Weed Science Society meeting on March 8th. But uh, transplanting shrubs and restoration reduces weed cover. And I'd like to thank um, all of our overseas collaborators. Tim Collier uh, is University of Wyoming. Aaron and John Gaskin are from uh, are from the Sydney, Montana facility. Especially like to thank the overseas people who really make all this possible. Um, I've Massimo's traveled around the world, and he ended up in our living room one day, so I took this picture of him. Um, I don't know what, um, how much time I have for questions. I could take a couple of questions, but I'll be around, too, if you have any questions about Russian olive biocontrol. Yes, Matt. What's the timeline we're looking at if we if we get to the point of uh, of initiating it? And I kind of deli I deliberately avoided timelines because I always give them and they're always wrong. Um, so I'll I'll say that if we get to the point uh, we're we're almost to the point of submitting a tag petition. By we I mean Tim Collier is. Uh, if that goes um, and everything goes smoothly with uh, with APHIS and with a Section Seven consultation. You could see it happen in five years or so. Seeing how Diarabda and the southwestern willow flycatcher all shake out in the end, too. More like 10 years. If at all, we might say no. Yes? That there's a poster on yellow billed cuckoo and Russian olive uh, locally. I'll definitely check it out.